Coming up, a tribal leader welcomes the growing Abenaki presence in the state of Vermont. Plus, writer and actor Bobby Wilson previews the upcoming and final season of the hit show Reservation Dogs. And fashion designer Patricia Michaels shares her latest work at the Cannes Film Festival in France. I'm Alia Chavez. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. We start today in Nebraska, where excavation is beginning at a boarding school that has been closed for 110 years. The state's archaeologists and others are working to find the remains of the dozens of children who died at the Federal Indian Boarding School and have been lost for over a century. The Genoa Indian Industrial School opened in 1884, and at one time, nearly 600 children from more than 40 nations were forced to attend. After the school closed in 1931, the cemetery filled with Native students was forgotten by administrators and the federal government. Ponca citizen Judy Goshkebosh is the executive director of the Nebraska Commission on Indian Affairs and has been involved in the cemetery effort for years. Her own mother went to the school in the 1920s. She said although it's been difficult to be at the site, the search can help with healing and bringing those children's voices to the surface. If the dig reveals remains, the state's archaeology office will continue to work with the commission to decide how to proceed. In the Pacific Northwest, there is a new ray of hope for indigenous nations who were cut off from accessing a sacred space. Native peoples have fished and gathered for ceremony since time immemorial at a massive waterfall near what is now Portland, Oregon. In the 1880s, a dam was built at Willamette Falls and lined with paper mills that denied natives access for ceremony. Just last month, Portland General Electric signed a pact with the native-led organization Willamette Falls Trust to potentially restore the path. But the process is not as fast as the river that powers PGE's economic empire. The utility company has only agreed to study ways to restore access and honor the connection native people have to the falls. Yaqui citizen and Willamette Trust leader Gerard Rodriguez says the process, nevertheless, is breaking new ground. We were able to build stronger relationships um, to kind of, in some places, create the very first conversations that um, some of these agencies have actually had with tribes and tribal governments. And now the entire landscape is, has shifted so that we can be in the lead, guiding the vision as Indigenous people in order to restore this place and bring others along rather than the other way around. As the environment ministers from eight countries that border the Amazon meet, struggles continue for the indigenous people in the rainforest. Last week, the Road to the Amazon Summit 2023 was held in Colombia. It gathered to lay the groundwork for next month's talks in Portugal. On the agenda was the well-being of the roughly 400 different indigenous peoples who live in the Amazon. Currently, these nations face ongoing threats to its lands related to natural resource development. Brazil's president, Luiz Lula da Silva, who is pushing to to present a joint declaration at COP28 in November, acknowledged Native people's work and influence. This is the first time in history that Brazil and Colombia 
both with progressive governments, have committed to putting the Amazon at the center of their policies. We have a lot in common. We are two great multicultural democracies marked with a valuable contribution of indigenous people. Now we head to Mesa, Arizona, where ICT's Dalton Walker has the story on one of the largest Native American basketball tournaments for youth in the United States. It's so big, in fact, that the organization who puts it on even designed an app for folks to keep track of game results. Take a look. It is no secret that basketball is wildly popular for Native American communities. That was on display here at the 2023 Sports Native Junior Nationals Tournament hosted by Tribe Athletics. A whopping 234 teams played 566 total basketball games here in late June. All of the players were indigenous ranging from elementary ages all the way to recent high school graduates. The athletes traveled far and wide to get here for the three-day competition, including from Canada and Alaska. John Yarrow Jr. is the founder and director of Tribe Athletics. He told me this idea started because he knew indigenous basketball players had the skills, but what they were lacking was exposure to college coaches and recruitment. We started locally, uh, me, and, me and my family, 15 years ago, we, we've been doing tournaments. There was a need that I seen because I was in that grassroots basketball myself, whether it's coaching or traveling with my kids, uh, seeing the elite of the elite, there was a need for this. The games are all played under one roof on about 16 basketball courts. That was a decision made on purpose. College coaches, uh, they love to look at multiple courts. They love being able to turn around and look at another court right there that is playing. 18-year-old Katie Waka is from the Menominee tribe and was recruited by the team Legendary Elite to play here. It was a key move given that Katie will play at the college level for the University of Wisconsin Lacrosse. She told ICT you did not have to look far to see the high level of competition from indigenous players here. In Mesa, Arizona, Dalton Walker, ICT News. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Abenaki tribes in Vermont worked for decades to gain recognition from the state and their efforts paid off beginning in 2011. Today, four tribes are recognized by the state, but recognition is only part of the effort to restore the presence of the area's original inhabitants. Chief Don Stevens of the Nolhegan Band spoke with ICT's Stuart Huntington about the work. Sir, welcome to our show. <laughs> Thank you. Should say Willa Winnie. Thank you. Sir, tell us a little bit about the relationship your nation has with the state. You don't have federal recognition, but you do have a relationship with Vermont. That is correct. We received uh, recognition officially, legal, I should say legal recognition in the state of Vermont uh, in 2011. Melhegan and El New Abenaki tribes were the first uh, Abenaki tribes in the states to be recognized. In, 2012, the Masisco and the Coasuk uh, received their recognition. Our traditional territory, uh, the Western Abenaki territory, goes from about Turner's Falls, Mass, up into all of New Hampshire, all of Vermont, up into Canada, across New, um, over to about Lake Umbagog. Uh, so we take care of our citizens in any of our traditional territories, wherever they live. What are the top issues facing your community? We'll start first with the language. When we were first concentrating on culture, one of the top priorities, I mean, when I say concentrating, I mean, culture is always part of who we are, right? But what I'm saying is there are very few fluent speakers left of the, of the Abenaki language. Um, so we wanted to preserve the language so we have it for our grandchildren. And um, so I started working with the Middlebury uh, College they have a world-class language program, and uh, we were working with them for food security as well uh, to see how we could preserve, how preserve the language. And one of uh, the Nalhegan citizens, Jesse Ruchak, um, he actually lived with a fluent speaker for a period of time and learned the language. 
So he is the director of the uh, Abenaki School of Language at Middlebury College. Middlebury College agreed to pilot it like three years ago, and now it's a uh, one of their core 12, 12 programs, you know, in the summer. So it's an immersion class for two weeks, and then there's um, there's online classes. Um, so the language is starting to be spoken and heard more, and uh, that also piggybacked into working with the state and the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs to get our language on state park signs when state park signs are replaced that'll include English and Abenaki language. And we're also working with various parts of the state to rename wildlife management areas or other types of things. So our language will always be heard and hopefully spoken. And sir, you mentioned food as an issue. Yeah, well, since there's uh, such a, a large health disparities with our community, we as a tribe, our responsibility is trying to find ways to, to feed our people. Because if you have lack of nutritious food, then you have higher health disparities. So it became a mission of our tribe to feed all of our people as best we can under food security. I don't call it food sovereignty because we don't have our own land. We only have a small part of uh, a small amount of acreage that belongs to the tribe. So if you can't grow your own food, you have to rely on others. So it's a three three pronged approach. One was to get land access so that way our people can gather natural foods and medicines uh, through land access agreements, which includes, you know, like gathering leeks, fiddleheads, you know, natural foods and medicines like our ancestors did traditionally. The second was to work with farmers who did have land uh, to help grow food. So we have a big garden program. Uh, we have a lot of growers that are producing food and we're educating them on our food systems and uh, we uh, recapture the seeds of our in indigenous seeds and we uh, create a seed bank so we can give to our citizens. So, And we have three, three food distribution sites uh, throughout not only the state of Vermont but New Hampshire to help feed our people. Um, and then I work with the Fish and Wildlife Department to get our hunting and fishing rights so that way people don't have to pay for their hunting licenses. They can go out and hunt um, wild game and uh, be able to feed their family in that way as well. So we have a, a food program. We, we did acquire a bison herd a couple of years ago. So we have bison to help feed our people as well. So that's part of our meat production. Is the bison herd on your acreage? It is not. Um, we have forest land in Barton. This is on a uh, lease land that we lease from a farmer and we pay them uh, basically grazing fees. And sir, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? All we want to do is be ourselves and, and to be able to leave something for our children and our grandchildren and to celebrate our culture, just like everybody else wants to do. And I think that um, our people have been through a lot of adversity uh, and still are. And I believe that we stay strong as a community. And if we can preserve our language, our culture, and our traditions, then that's all we can ask for. And, and to be able to make our lives of our children and our grandchildren much easier than where we, we have it. So we can stand on our, our the shoulders of our ancestors, and maybe they can stand on ours. Chief Don Stevens, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I'll say adio. Nanawamazi olibam kani means uh, goodbye, take care until I see you again, and I hope you have safe journeys. From writing to performing, Dakota citizen Bobby Wilson is always keeping himself busy. He spoke to ICT about the upcoming and final season of FX's Reservation Dogs and shares a couple of stories. Dakota citizen Bobby Wilson is a storyteller. For the hit TV show Reservation Dogs, the poet nicknamed Bobby Dews pulled from the pain and joy of his youth in St. Paul and Minneapolis, Minnesota. I mean, I grew up in the East Side when I was a teenager. A lot of time, my, the, the boys' home that I was sentenced to that I wrote about for Res Dogs was in the East Side. So I spent two years in a county, in a Ramsey County boys' home, right next to the police station. That's so stupid. And uh, she's the only one who's like, house we haven't been to. You know, everybody else, even Willie Jack, you know, we got a whole episode of her and her dad. So it's like, um, I, I pitch, I was, I was pretty nervous to pitch it because I didn't want it to be like a sad, you know, like sad story and or, you know, sad cheese storyline. 
and uh, uh, you know, I was so happy and you know, eternally grateful to Sterling when I pitched like cheese in the boys' home. It's like, what if he don't have his parents? Like, what if we don't really even know where they are at? Because that happens to a bunch of native kids. It happened to me. I didn't know where the hell my parents were for like most of my teen years. Bobby talked about the show's impact and how every part of the production centered the ways native people work together. It, it, it ain't my show. And it is everybody who watched its show. It's like what you're saying, I, you know, that's that's the goal. And there's like 10 of us on on a little council who get to do like philosophize back and forth for a few weeks to come up with those stories and to tell each other's stories and say, I knew like 20 kids like that, you know, growing up or something, you know, you, it's like everybody had that experience, even if they were on sort of the fringe of it. Everybody knew some kids who were going through that, and and, and like like everything that the kids go through in the episode. Um, yeah, so we try our best to represent. And I was so freaking touched, man! I got like a bunch of messages afterwards from people who had gone, who had grown up in like the institutionalized systems, you know, for one reason or the other, ended up, you know having to ask some housing authority to go on pass, you know, to do whatever, I don't know, go see your friends after school or something. It it was such a a success in its first season. Uh, critics and audiences loved it on its second season. And for a third season to come through, I mean, really, it's, it's 100% a creative choice. And, you know, I'm not trying to talk, I don't want to talk out of turn on it because it's not my decision. The the showrunner, our, our, uh, the guy who led the whole thing, Sterling, it's his, you know, primarily his creative choice. Uh, and it makes sense. You know, he, t- he called everybody, he talked to us all about it. And, you know, uh, I'm not going to spoil anything about the season, but, you know, it's like uh, to just keep on going with n- like the same, I guess, story world, uh, living in that space it's uh, it, we don't want to lose the magic and the beauty of that and to like let it play out the way that it naturally was because that's really mostly what we do in the writer's room is like we're drawing logical conclusions to stories you know or like we're 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 moving this thing along in it's uh in all its different lines and all the different arcs and you know, we don't want to keep rebooting like you know season four cheese becomes you know uh I don't know. Wilson, who was also an incredible muralist, talked about the flow and the magic they made behind the scenes of Reservation Dogs. It's a big decision. I mean, there's so much love between everyone who makes it. And it's such a personal thing. And I've seen like, (laughs) like years long beefs mended on the set of that show, you know, and like there's there's a magic to it. And, um, you know, it's like one, all of us wrote that it becomes so personal and there's so much that we share with each other in the, in the uh, planning of that story. And then even in the creation of it, everyone else that comes in, our, our line producer, our, all of our different directors that come in and, and lend their lives and expertise and magic to the set and to the story, to our first AD, our, uh, who, who, who are arena directors that keep going and like the magical uh, 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 DP who just, you know, all eyes on everything. It's really beautiful. Uh, and you don't want to, you want to keep going with that forever. It's really like, could heaven ever be like this? You know, like, <laughs> And it and it will again, you know, like that's really I think the wonderful thing is like, you know, nobody wanted this show to like uh devolve into something corny that like you know is just for the money or for the sake of making it like we gotta keep making more stuff. And we are like everybody in our in our crew, everybody on our team is doing so much. And I'm like, I'm just super pumped to see where it goes from here. And finally, Bobby Wilson. Sasituan, while Paytuan citizen and my new at the relative, gave some advice for Indian country as we all begin the final season of another amazing indigenous show. Quit crying around. It's gonna be fine. 
You see this hat? There's ideas in that hat. And these hands, these are hands of action. This is amazing, but I don't know if my dad is that into pickles. What kind of native rapper ain't into pickles? You don't have anything more like a hardcore rapper would wear? Like a spicy pickle? In Bismarck, North Dakota, Vincent Moniz, ICT News. Indigenous movie stars were front and center at the Cannes Film Festival in May to promote the upcoming film Killers of the Flower Moon. Some of them used the moment to highlight Indigenous fashion. Joining us now virtually is Patricia Michaels. She has been producing one-of-a-kind couture for the last 20 years. Hello to you, Patricia. Hello, thank you for having me. It's a huge honor to be here. My native name is Water Lily, and I'm from Taos Pueblo. My Pueblo relative are very happy that you're here today. Actress Tantu Cardinal wore a gown that you created called Tantu in Flight. That was in France at the Cannes Film Festival, as I just mentioned. Tell us about the gown and what it features. So when um, Jolie Proudfit had contacted me to see if I might be interested in creating the gown for Tantu, of course, I had already been creating that gown in my head and um, through another client. And I, and she's Osage, her name is Julie O'Keefe. And so I did this beautiful illustration after um, uh, Tantu and Julie contacted me. And I sent it to Tantu on a Zoom meeting and she said, Oh my God, I'd be so honored. This is so beautiful. So then we got started. But in the thought of creating something for such an important and a person that I admire with my whole heart and soul, she's the most um, prolific and celebrated Native American actor, actress that we have. And her years and decades of hard work, I wanted to celebrate in representation of an eagle because she, I think she had earned that kind of type of um, symbolism of something that is regal and, and that we will honor for her taking us into this beautiful years and highlighting the truth who we are as Native American. And I made a gown so that it would take her long journey that she's been, you know, doing her work in flight the way she is. And then also I wanted the feathers to brush away her trail so that she's always going into new direction. And so she's always going forward because she's always has been going forward in an industry that has not been very kind or easy for any Native American. And so I do a lot of, I mean, my eagle feathers are a lot of signature eagle feathers throughout the years on, on silk because I feel that silk carries the, the beauty and the, the likeness of the feather where it is, has endurance, it has strength, and it's graceful. I love to use it for women because the, the grace that Native women have and Native women are so strong that we um that the type of work that we do in our native country is immense and we're pretty tough people that i wanted to i wanted to honor her with this i wanted to to acknowledge that there here's a woman that is going to walk the red carpet not only for herself but for the greatness that she's she's given to native country and so i i put a team together of 11 people so there was 12 of us in all, all from Taos and, and uh, the town of Taos, Taos Pueblo, and a, a woman from Santa Fe. And we just got to town. We just got to work. Actually, there was 13 of us. And we we just I, I delegated different jobs for everybody. And in two weeks, it was made. And I finished doing all the hand stitching of all the eagle feathers in um, her beautiful room in, at Cannes. And that was three days of no sleep, just eating nuts and drinking water, whatever juice was brought in. And um, there was about 20,000 hand stitches that were finished. And she couldn't have been more 
graceful and honorable to this whole process. I think more than anything, I received such knowledge and privileged to have come close with her and experience her stories, her strengths, and everything that I had put into the garments, which has come over the years, really showed in the beautiful woman that she is inside. To honor our people is how we are raised. You know, when somebody is called upon to be the person who's going to carry the ceremony, somehow we traditionally get the garments done, the ceremony outfits done, and before you know it, the ceremony's happy. And that's how I felt when I was asked to do this garment. Well, fashion designer and entrepreneur Patricia Michaels, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Native American country. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.